uh, this morning. We're joined here in the studio by the Conservative MP Chris Philp and by the Shadow Treasury Minister Jonathan Reynolds. Welcome to both of you. Um, Chris, the figures are terrible. Well, the figures are lower than was expected. But if you analyse um, the economy as a whole, we see an economy that is creating record numbers of jobs. Unemployment is at, is at a 43-year low, lower than it's been during my lifetime. And as you said a few minutes ago, um, wage growth running at about 2.8 per cent is now outstripping inflation running at about 2.5. That's all good news. Now, I spent this morning looking at the spreadsheet the ONS produced. It was an exciting morning. Lucky as you, can, you. As you can imagine, <laughs> yes. it was, uh, you know. So enlighten us. Well, so I looked at the different sectoral <laughs> impacts and it was so services, which is the biggest part of the economy, 79 per cent grew at plus 0.3, which is the expectation. Now, the construction component shrunk by 3.3. And the NHBC, the National Federation of House Buildings, says that was down to the bad weather. So I ran a little calculation. I said, what if that construction figure of minus 3.3 had been the same as services? And if you plug that in, the total number that drops out the bottom is plus 0.3. So I think you can attribute this to the construction drop caused by the weather. But this is, as you say, only one quarter. So the you're blaming the weather. I mean, Liz Truss just said she but wasn't going to blame the weather. She wasn't going to blame leaves on the line. I mean, 0.1% well, I'll, I'll have to share my spreadsheet with her. Is, you will have to. Yes, well, good luck with that. It still comes down to 0.1%. It's barely moving the economy. Say, and this was after Philip Hammond basically came and told the Commons uh, to be positive and optimistic about the future. Look, it's a, it's a one-quarter GDP figure. Let's look at the record job numbers. Let's look at the, the deficit is now the current deficit on current spending has for the first time in 15 years been eliminated. Wages rising faster than inflation. So taking the bigger picture, I think we do have an economy in good health. Right. I don't know if you've been looking at any spreadsheets, but you don't have to tell us about those. Um, what do you say to Chris Philp saying this is just one quarter of figures? Yes, they are disappointing. But if you look at other factors, it's not as bad as perhaps those fingers, uh, figures indicate. Well, I thought that was a really brave and valiant attempt from Chris, and I, I admire <laughs> his, his efforts to put it across that way, whether you've been spending time with, with spreadsheets or not. You've got to look at the big picture, OK? So the entire narrative from the government is we've had the pain, now the good times are here. Even though the OBR then comes out and says, actually, the UK is set for its worst period of economic growth since the Second World War. The government come back and say, no, we'll outperform the forecast. We always do better than the OBR. And then we get the hard data, and it's as dismal as this. For an MP like me, who's been in the Commons since 2010, austerity and that emergency budget and the economic policy that began at that point could not have failed in any bigger degree. And at some point, the government and Conservative colleagues, no matter how brave and valiant they are to put a spin on things, are going to have to acknowledge the government has been getting it wrong. So austerity not, was well, to blame? Not nonsense. I mean, look, as I said, we have finally cleared our current deficit after 15 years. And the real proof of the pudding is, you know, are our fellow citizens in work? Are their wages going up? And the answer is they're in work in record numbers and our fellow citizens' wages are going up faster than inflation. What's happened to consumer confidence then? And, well, I mean, I haven't looked at the consumer confidence figures in detail. You missed those out then. I, I, my spreadsheet wasn't, wasn't universal. It didn't have consumer confidence. Well, we just confidence. heard from Kamal Ahmed that that um, is the problem, that that is what is driving... Well, not with, not with, these, not with the GDP figure in Q1, in my, in my opinion. I think that was the drop in construction. Um, but as far as wider consumer confidence is concerned, continuing to create jobs and making sure wages grow faster than inflation, which they are now doing for the first time in a year or so, is the key to unlocking that consumer confidence. So I am optimistic looking ahead and I'm proud that we've created record jobs right I mean you may not have created them but all right you might have set the circumstances for those jobs to be created I mean if you look at that side of the picture you acknowledge the jobs that have been created um, during a period post crash which did surprise people wages are now for the first time beginning to outstrip prices that will make the consumer feel better so do you think the next quarter will be more positive well you must always look at the trend rather than any particular quarter that, that's a fair point to make but no, I, I don't share the, the feeling Chris has that things are about to get much better. If you look at what the last 10 years since the financial crisis have meant for people, they have been incredibly hard years. Of course, consumer confidence is not high when we've got the kind of uncertainty surrounding a bigger deal as Brexit. So the government should step in and do more to do that. What it is doing instead is continuing that squeeze on, on local authority budgets, continuing that squeeze on NHS spending, public sector pay caps still not totally removed. The government has got it wrong. It has not changed its policy. It is continuing on the wrong sets of policies. And we're not going to get the kind of change we need until the government realises. What do you what think is to blame, Steve? I think, it's, I think initially it's a big miss. I try and be optimistic, but I disagree with Chris. It's a big miss. And the worry is momentum. I mean, the economists this morning were really spooked by this. And they think what happens now with momentum going forward. So I think to blame... 
The consumer's got nothing more to give. If you look at the savings ratio, it's at a historic low. They've been spending and spending and spending and spending on plastic. We just had Christmas again. They've got through that. They've now reined it in. And you've got the Brexit uncertainty, the huge uncertainty over what we do now. Construction is a big part of it, as Chris says. 3.3%, um, I think it would have added 0.1 to it, actually, rather than 0.2. So that's a big factor. But there is this uncertainty lingering over the economy. What the, what's the government going to do? And the trouble now is if the unemployment figures start dipping away. Because if growth is slowing, and then we've had unemployment, very, very low employment, peak employment, what happens if that changes? Right. I mean, are we reading too much into one set of figures? It's always misleading to just focus on one quarter. You have to look at you know, the ongoing trend. But if we see something similar next quarter, mm. if we see it, you know, this sustained recovery that's not happening, that's a problem for so many reasons, all the reasons that we've mentioned, but also because this is the time at which pressure on government is really intense to start spending on public services now. People feel you know, the NHS is, is sort of bursting at the seams. There's a real feeling that, that things can't carry on being suppressed as they are. This is when government needs the economy to be firing on all cylinders. And it really, that expected recovery just hasn't delivered. The, the glimmer of hope for the consumers, this means the interest rate hike isn't going to mm. take place in May. Right. right. Well, so I would... that, that will be, that's the one ray of light on the side. You know that, do you? I know that. I've got my own spreadsheet, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Mr Carney sent me it earlier. I mean, on that basis, another issue that Liz Truss raised was housing. Um, but the news this week is that an average home in England and Wales now costs £225,000, which is 7.8 times, I've got my own figures, a full-time worker's salary. So, I mean, are we kissing goodbye to a younger generation ever being able to really afford homes? Well, you're certainly right to say there is a big problem with affordability of housing, both to buy and also to rent, particularly in London and the South. So there is a problem, no question about that. The solution to that is obviously to buy more homes, build more homes. Yeah. Um, we have seen Which every homes start... government keeps... Well, and to be fair, under, under Labour, in the last year of the Labour government, it had collapsed to about 125,000 a year. We're now over 200,000. It's nearly doubled since Labour left office. But there is further to go. There was a, a, another glimmer uh, yes, in yesterday's figures showing a record number of first-time buyers, encouraged by the stamp duty cut for first-time buyers and the extension of help to buy. So those things are moving in the right direction, but there is a long way to go. Right, but for true. new homes, it's now going to cost people 9.7 mm. times the average salary. I mean, that's unreachable now, isn't yeah. it? It is It is way too expensive. There is no question about that. And that's why we need to get behind building more homes, hence the £9 billion for affordable housing, hence the £5 billion in housing infrastructure funding announced a few weeks ago. If we do all of those things and we get up from the 200,000, still double what Labour did, mm. up to the 300,000, then I think these problems that you're describing will start to ease. Right, let's not have a battle about who built more homes uh, when. We know that there is a housing shortage and crisis and you would back and welcome the proposals that have been put in place by the government over the last year. Well, I don't want to sound cynical, but yesterday the House of Commons saw the government come and give a statement that it didn't really need to give, telling us how successful their housing policies mm. had been. Today we get this bad bit of news and it turns out actually they found they've not been that successful. Don't worry, they've found they've got more policies and it's all going to be fine. Right. The policies the government have pursued so far, I mean, it does, I won't get into the numbers game, but the way, the, the way Conservatives take the figures of anything for the last years of the financial crisis and the aftermath of that, and then somehow claim, when you look at the trend, they've actually done much worse, but they use that last year as a, as a benchmark to do things. It is extremely frustrating. You've gone to the lowest level of house building since the 1920s as Conservatives. It's under Labour. Now. Last year of Labour was the no, lowest no, year. It's not, it's not. That's just simply not starts, true. You're, 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 you're I not, said there was going to be no places. battle over the numbers. Um, you've, both fa housing, you've both though. failed on housing, it seems to me. Um, but thank you both for coming in.